Good evening and welcome to Backstage Stories. I am Marcia Pendleton, your host on WBAI 99.5 FM streaming on WBAI.org. And what you just heard was the opening music from a new audio play called Shadowland. And it was composed by Delphio Marsalis and we'll find out more about his role in the audio play shortly. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome recent Susan Smith Blackburn Prize winner, Erica Dickinson Dispenza, and acclaimed actress and co-founder of Quicksilver Theater Company, Lizanne Mitchell to Backstage Stories. We'll talk about the world premiere of Dickinson Dispenza's audio play, Shadowland, a devastating drama set during Hurricane Katrina, centered on the experience of a Black mother and daughter in New Orleans as the hurricane approaches. It is produced by the Public Theater. And I want to say welcome to Erica and Lizanne. Thank you. Thank you. How are you <laughs> two doing this evening? All is well? All is well. All is well. All is well. Great. Before we jump into the interview, I just want to share just a little bit about each of you with the audience. Erica is a Black queer feminist poet, playwright, and cultural worker. She is a, the recipient of numerous, and please believe me, it's numerous <laughs> <laughs> awards, fellowships, and commissions. There are too many of them to mention. And Lizanne is an acclaimed actress who has numerous credits that span Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, television, and film. And like I said before, she is also the co-founder of the Quicksilver Theater Company. So ladies, can we jump right in? Yeah. yeah okay, great. I want to ask you a simple question first. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? How did or did that upbringing introduce you to the arts? You want to start us off, Erica? Sure. I always feel like when, when Black people are asked where we're from, it's such a complicated question. Yeah. Um, but I was born and, and raised in Chicago, Illinois, on the west side of Chicago. I know a lot of people who are not from the Midwest and here Chicago think all Black people live on the south side. But in fact, there has been uh, a thriving um, and resilient Black community on Chicago's west side uh, for a number of decades. Um, my people are from New Orleans, Louisiana, um, Mabin, Mississippi, and Birmingham, Alabama. And so I'm very much rooted there. Um, those of us from the, the Black Midwest call it up south because we are so very connected, right, still to the South and, and Southern tradition and culture. Um, my people were stolen from Cameroon. Um, my maternal lineage is of the Bamaleki uh, Cameroonian um, people. And so I, I want to lift them as well. Um, raised in a community of women, of black women. I know no other way of life than, than village and sisterhood. And so I think that those are um, prominent themes in my work but the ways of, of being a black woman in the world and surviving and thriving and creating spaces of joy, clearing spaces so that we can um, exist together uh, in, our, in our private uh, sacred spaces of our homes and, and things like that. I think taught me a lot about what it meant to create a life uh, as opposed to accepting one that is handed to you. And about the power of communities of, of Black women, what a sustaining force, what the backbone of mutual aid campaigns and uh, rent parties and all that kind of jazz was about. So um, I am grateful to have witnessed that growing up. Yeah. Miss Lizanne? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. She's so young and all of that has already happened. Uh -huh. That's amazing. <laughs> oh. 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 So I'm, I'm a, a, a Southern woman, you know, I'm from Greensboro in North Carolina, 
and um, what can I say? I came up in a in in a neighborhood which was really beautiful because there was a black doctor there and uh, there was a piano teacher right up the street and uh, all the businesses were owned by black people. You know, the churches were there, uh, but somehow my parents who were converted Catholics felt it best for me to go to the Catholic school. So that's when my, you know, turn into a whole nother world took place. And for a long time, I, I lived in two worlds because I, you know, I, my friends were in, uh, in the public schools, which were black. And there I was in the uh, Catholic school, which was for, as a first black when I was in grade school, but then integration took place. So I went to one of the first integrated uh, Catholic schools. And, you know, we just, all kinds of things went, went down there. We had bomb scares and of course, everybody was marching to uh, desegregate, which meant the whole town was marching. We were booked in a place the size of the Javits Center. There were 19 of us in one cell at first. I think I was incarcerated maybe three times, you know, much to my mother's chagrin, <laughs> you know. But she was a very progressive woman. So I re feel like in her heart of hearts, I had her blessing. So mm. it was not, um, I didn't have an easy growing up life, but a very informed growing up life. I went to mm -hmm, uh, the college right there in my hometown and a, a funny thing happened. Um, it was one of the one of the big demonstrations that we were in. I mean, the, the whole downtown was packed. And so this man comes up to me and he said, uh, where are you going to school when you get out of high school? And I said, I, I don't know. He <laughs> said, well, Come to A and T College, which is where I went. It was a college in there, it's a state university. He said, "Come to right. A and T College because you are an actress," and he was head of the drama department. So my whole journey in uh, theater has been blessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially coming mm -hmm. out of North Carolina A and T, I have friends who work there. I have friends who have gone to school there, and they all love the experience of North Carolina a and now State University. It is, it is an amazing program that has um, given us some extraordinary people, including you, mm -hmm. including you. Thank you, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You know, I'd so like you to describe your journey as artist who influenced you. Why did you decide to write? Erica, I can almost gather that from some of the things that you've told us uh, from the uh, very beginning of this, this program. Uh, why did you decide to write to tell stories? And, and Lizanne, why did you decide to tell stories through acting? Oh, wow. This is okay. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about uh, Toni Morrison talking to us and, and saying how, you know, we do language and that may be the meaning of life. And so I like to think I've been doing language my entire life. Um, I was walking and talking at eight months old and I like to tell this story as part of the answer to this particular question when I'm asked, because I, I think it continues to teach me something about myself um, regarding this question. And so I was, I was uh, with my mother and several of my aunts and extended aunts, um, one of whom was the uncool aunt who was responsible for babysitting during the blue light basement parties uh, <laughs> on Fulton Street, right? Um, and, you know, my aunt Vern, that was her name, is her name. She was getting ready to leave the house and I'm eight months old. I had not been doing the kind of dawdling walk that, you know, toddlers begin to do. And I hadn't said more than mama. Um, and I see her getting ready to leave. And my mother and aunts tell the story that I got up, ran across the room. And as I was running said, Aunt Vern, I want to go with you. And of course, it freaks everyone out and everyone freezes because they're like, she is eight months old. 
And so I like to think that I had been collecting language, right? That I had been acquiring it and waiting for the time that I had something urgent to say. And so I think of uh, how I come into storytelling first through poetry and then through uh, theater in, in the same vein that I was an avid reader, that I was set free by Nikki Giovanni's Black Feeling, Black Talk, Black Judgment that I took out from a library. Remember those? Um, <laughs> you know, I took out this book from the library and in middle school, I think I was in like fifth or sixth grade because I used to walk to the library regularly. And um, for the first time I saw very daring words and thoughts from a, a little tiny black woman with an Afro, militant black woman. And I didn't know we could say those things. I didn't know we had permission. And so in many ways, um, after that, checking out all of Nikki Giovanni's books, um, not understanding half of what she was talking about quite yet, you know, as a middle schooler, um, writing poetry and then being involved in um, communities like Young Chicago Authors in Chicago and getting more formal training and then going to the private art school, Chicago Academy for the Arts for high school and being in the media arts department, rebelling a lot against the curriculum in which we were um, avidly reading white women poets who were largely just writing about nature. And I respect right relationship with the earth, but I said, I, surely black women have that too. Surely black women have something to say on the matter. And then discovering, you know, Rita Dove and Lucille Clifton and what Nina Simone had to say through her lyrics and having the teachers that I had, um, Avery R. Young and Krista Franklin, who introduced me to Nina Simone. Um, I read Ntozaki Shange for the first time uh, as a sophomore in high school and was casted as Lady in Brown in a uh, reading production of it at the DuSable Museum uh, in Chicago. And that changed my life. And um, knowing that I wasn't restricted to one form, restricted to one discipline, that as fluid as Black people's storytelling is in terms of elements of music and, and dance and laughter and grief and, 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 that that too was a way of writing. And so I think that as I grew, the stories that I wanted to tell expanded, which meant that I needed a bigger form, a more expansive form than um, what written poetry allowed. And, and my world opened up when I read Zaki, my literary mother, and it has never been the same. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> Lizanne? Well, you know, I was always uh, a very fanciful little one, you know. When I, I used to love the movie magazines and the women in there, you know, and the way they would turn their head. And even in my, my little picture when they were having sepia tone pictures, I think I was about four, I had turned my head and looked like one of those movie stars that I saw because I thought that was me. And I would give these big plays with my sheet in the living room, my grandmother and my mother, and they thought that that was pretty awesome. So there was a summer institute at Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, where mm -hmm. they embraced young actors. And so my mother said, mm -hmm, that's the perfect place for her. <laughs> I so I can get a break. <laughs> so uh, I went there and when I stepped out on the stage, my first role was as this witch and they had this cauldron of dry ice and I knew I was at home. So I've always known that this is what I wanted to do. You know, I, I've always been able in my mind to tell the story of a lot of different people. You know, I, I'm, I'm like a lot of some, some actors, uh, you can tell their, their trademark is their style. And um, I don't particularly like to have a style. I like to be able to change and morph into whoever's story I am telling. So it's been a, an ongoing joy to me and continues to be. There have been a lot of challenges, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, and of course, uh, 
the journey of being a black actress, particularly during the times and, and, and before the times that I grew up in, you know, that seemed like a, a very naive choice. But I think as an artist, because I also love other forms of art too and participate in them, I think you don't have a choice. You just do what you love and deal with the challenges as they come because nothing is more fulfilling than how you express yourself. What other forms of art are you involved with? Well, you know, I, the, the, the thing of it with my father, um, no, nobody blocked me, you know, in terms of, of being an, uh, an, an artist or, or an actor. Any of that. I, I never knew that that was not a good choice. <laughs> you know, They never told me. So I thought it was cool and good and doable. But um, I also love to draw and I've drawn all my life. I remember my grandmother said in the little report cards I would get when in nursery school, they said that, you know, Anne is always happiest when she's drawing and she draws all the time. So my father, that's the path that he would have preferred me to take, I believe, you know, other than the acting. Because when I told him about, you know, being an actress, he said, you know, you know, and, and back then, this was a long time ago. So back then, he said, you know, get you a job and making a hundred thousand dollars or more, you know, you know, and you, you can do this act thing. You can do that. You can do that. But, you know, come on. And I asked my brother because I thought I would get, you know, uh, some kind of affirmation. He agreed with my father totally. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it sounded like uh, your father sounded like my my mother. Um, get a job, and it can be an uh, avocation, not your vocation. I was just no. like, oh no, 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 work work for the federal government. Yeah, like, no, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. So I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. Uh, I'd like you to speak about the importance of us telling our own stories because there has been such a push over the, I guess since the summer about black content. And then some of the time I realized that even though there are black people on the screen, it, they have not necessarily written the words that they speak, they have not designed the set or directing or have anything to do with anything other than being a presence in front of the cameras. So talk about the importance of being a Black content creator. We can start with Erica, and then I'd like to hear from Lizanne regarding this. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important uh, to me to go further and say a Black woman, a queer Black woman content okay. creator, mm -hmm. um, because I am always all of those things. Mm -hmm. And um, the racialized sexism is as real as the <laughs> as the racism uh, that we experience that isn't gendered, or that we don't think is gendered, uh, and that the homophobia, um, queer phobia, uh, is also simultaneously real. Um, I grew up poor and working class, and so I write poor and working class Black women who have dignity and style and opinions and intelligence um, because we are complicated human beings and that the, those are the women who raised me. Um, I write smart mouth, quote unquote, uh, fast tail, quote unquote, uh, black girls who are good at math and have opinions about sex and are queer and are curious and, you know, quick witted um, because that's who I went to school with. And in many ways, that is who I am. Um, you know, I write Black women elders who are saucy and sensual and tough and religious and secular, you know, because that is who all of my grandmothers were, um, spirited and ancient and youthful and joyful. Um, you know, I, I write middle-aged Black women who are still discovering new things about themselves 
because that self-discovery does not stop. I see it in my aunties and in my other mothers. Um, and so I think what it does to be writing my own people and for that to be very particular and go beyond them just being black, right? Because we are not a homo, uh, genetic, it's not, you know, homogeneous, like we don't, homogenous, we don't have, we're not all the same. Our experiences are not the same, particularly across race, uh, complexion, mm -hmm. across class, uh, across uh, linguistics, right? Uh, New Orleans sounds very different than Chicago. And what does that mean in different uh, physical and professional spaces? Um, that being very specific and very true to the communities who name me, uh, to, to say that in the Tony K. Bambara way, uh, keeps me humble and keeps me true and uh, keeps me writing the record for the archive that I, I don't see existing um, for the, the women that I write by and large. And so adding to that record um, and having my peers add to that, that record in their own way from their own very specific places um, helps to correct the record that is there, right? Um, and it is my way of, of honoring the people before me, the, the women before me and avenging them. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. I am. <laughs> Well, I, I tell you, like, um, it is my belief from the bottom of my heart, you know, deep in the marrow of my bones, that African people are the oldest people on the planet and our amassed wisdom and knowledge is of invaluable uh, importance to humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, there is no other story that is, a, is as important to me as telling this story. Okay. Okay. I want to know, inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> <laughs> how do you choose the projects or do they choose you? Anybody? Am I starting? Wanna, oh. <laughs> you wanna take that on? Uh, you know, I think my work always starts on a very spiritual plane. You know, every writer is different. Every, every writer's process is different. Um, my work is very ancestral. And so uh, I like to think that I am called to write certain things that things and stories thunder through me and I am, I am the channel if I am rightly available um, to do my work well, if I am listening and communing with my ancestors regularly, if I am open to spirit enough to hear um, and to be obedient. I wish that I could choose my story sometimes. And I think I would choose comedies uh, a bit more, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> you know, and that is how I know <laughs> that I cause a certain thing. Because if I had my way, I, I might um, veer towards something lighter or easier. And I'm by no means saying that the genre of comedy is easier. But um, in thinking about the, the topics of my work, I'm talking uh, topics and themes that I might veer towards something lighter out of fear. Um, and yeah, I, I, am, I am drawn to the wound and I am drawn to the way Black women always turn the wound in our hand into something else. The way we conjure, the way we heal, the way we transform and the way we struggle together. Um, and in every way that uh, humbles me and encourages me and tells me that, you know, there is nothing that I am doing for the first time because someone in my history has done it. And let me remember that my whole life is about remembering. Um, and that my creating is coming out of remembering and that teaches me how to go forth. So um, I write a lot about history 
some history that we are currently making, some history that has in some iteration already passed, but all of it is to instruct us for the future and to guide us in the right now. Um, and I, I think that is spirit work. So I think it's, um, it's being called to it. My experience of your work is what you just said, it's, it's very evident in your work. Oh, it's extraordinary. Uh, it's extraordinary. And we're going to speak about Shadowland uh, in just a few, but Lizanne, would you like to answer that question? Do you choose your projects or do your projects choose you or both? I think uh, probably both. Um, the majority of my life, our writers have not had the opportunity to write and be heard by the public in the way that they deserve to be, you know, in the, in the way that humanity deserves to hear. So I kind of had to deal with what was there, you know, which was rich, but I always knew it was more, but I always knew that we weren't being allowed to tell the mm -hmm. real deal. It just wasn't happening. It's just been of late that that has come about. But in the meantime, uh, those pieces, because I've worked at Crossroads Theater, which in back in the old days with the pole in the middle of the... <laughs> In the middle of right the in the middle of the stage, you know, <laughs> and it was like uh, it was it, it was like working in heaven because it was all new work by extraordinary black writers with extraordinary black actors, you know, and uh, so there there have been beautiful beautiful things that happen, but I can tell by a resonance in my. Spirit. I can tell by the, the feeling, you know, in the, I'm on a meditation path and uh, we call spiritual energy Shakti. And when that Shakti is, is, is vibrant and she is kicking up in me, I know I must do that role and I will wait patiently if there's a line. <laughs> okay. But I'm blessed <laughs> by, uh, by Erica, you know, I know she gets tired of me saying this, but you know, <laughs> Her words, uh, they're like nectar coming out of my mouth. And it's just, you know, I'm just, I'm just, just blessed. We'll be able to hear so a, little <laughs> bit of, a little bit of that a little further in the program. This is Backstage Stories on listener-supported WBAI 99.5 FM and streaming online at WBAI.org. I'm Marcia Pendleton, and I am your host. And we're going to experience a little bit of New Orleans music. Lizanne gave me the choice of, her choice of the Neville Brothers and I'd like to hear some of that right now, Max. <laughs> Yeah. 
Now that's some music. Yeah. Tell it like it is by the Neville Brothers. And we are returning to our discussion of Shadowland, which is set in New Orleans. And it is an audio play by Erica Dickinson Dispenza, produced by the Public Theater. And Erica, I'd love for you to talk about your relationship with the public theater. How did you and the yeah. public? You know, meet? I. Keep going. Oh, my connection. There was a little thing, you know, uh, technology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have had uh, an incredible opportunity to develop. Um, a formidable relationship with the public under, you know, Oscar Eustace's tenure as artistic director. I, I joke with him a lot about him being my Joe Pat in the way uh, that Joe and Zaki mm -hmm. formed a relationship and she developed so much of her work that premiered at the public, you know, under Joe's uh, tenure as AD. And um, it is an artistic home for me. I grapple with my involvement at institutions, understanding the role of institutions in this country as being a part of empire by and large. And so, you know, as a queer black young woman working within institutions while also working to decolonize um, spaces and my people, uh, myself, right? Um, how, how, I, how I navigate that. And the public has been and is a space that I can thoroughly challenge and say, this is what I need for my work. And this is how I will do my work. And these are the people I will do my work with. These are musicians who are outside of theater and it's gonna be all right. And this is the artist that I want for this. And I'm gonna need this. And we do altar work in my room and you're gonna be okay. <laughs> you know, that um, that we really create the world that we want to um, build art in, and we do that together. I feel very supported, and I know it's a privilege to, um, I don't want to say it's a privilege to be at that institution, because these institutions are privileged to have us, but it is a privilege to have comrades who understand the vision that you have for the world and for your work and to uh, lock arms with you and do what they can with all of the resources that they have to make it help make it come to pass. And so that's been the relationship that I've been able to cultivate and sustain at the public over the past few years. And I look forward to um, that continuing. Shadowland was supposed to be something that was for the stage. How did it become an audio play. And I'd also like you to speak about your relationship with your director, Candace C. Jones. Mm -hmm. She did an extraordinary yeah. job on, on this audio piece. 
and your actors and your relationship specifically with Lizanne. I would like you both to comment on that. <laughs> oh yes, this is a joy. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Colored Water was supposed to premiere uh, June, July of 2020, and we had just finished casting uh, in January of 2020, and it entered a workshop of the play. We've workshopped the play so much, um, and that is a privilege to have extensive workshop time over the course of a year, year and a half before the production um, happened. Um, and we had workshopped the production in mid-February of 2020. COVID happens March. Um, everything is postponed indefinitely until we can safely gather. And around October, maybe November, um, you know, Oscar Jack Moore, then dramaturg turned um, director of new artists, asked me, uh, you know, are there plays that you want Oscar to read while, you know, we're in this time because he has more time to read plays? And I'm just kind of, you know, moping about my show a bit and saying, well, you could send him Shadowland or Hieroglyph. I haven't touched those in a minute because I've been focused on Colored Water, but those are next in the pipeline for me to, you know, further develop. And so he gives Oscar Shadowland and Oscar asks to meet and he's, you know, talking to me about things he's loved about Shadowland and how different it is than Colored Water and um, experiencing my writing a two-hander between this uh, elder elder mother and her adult daughter. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's great. You know, theater shut down, quote unquote. So I'm, you know, just listening to him talk about a play that we can't do. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, so yeah, I think it would, I, I think it would, you know, be great as an audio play. What do you think of that? And I'm like, I don't, because that's not what I wrote it for. Um, not really interested in audio plays and he's kind of reminiscing on his childhood hearing audio plays and I'm just kind of like well that's nice uh I'm not interested and then we negotiate a bit uh and I I get some some desires uh for work that I have in the future met and and we are able to uh present Shadowland as as an audio play first um it is not the last we will see of that play but um once I talk to Candace, who is not just my director, but in, in so many ways is my creative partner. And I shared this during our toast, our opening night toast yesterday, but it is one thing, you know, to journey through a play, a project uh, with someone. And it's another thing to journey through life with someone and create art with them. Um, and so Candace understands the heart of my work, the, um, ancestral spirit of my work and the style of my work like no other. Um, she trusts what I am trying to do in the spirit and on the page and knows how to make it come to life. Um, and she trusts the vision and is very much rooted in, in place and spirit in the way that I am in my work. And so because she comes with that reverence and that honor and um, that intention we work so well together and uh have forged a very beautiful partnership in that way across projects so she's also directing colored water um and it's it's a it's quite a formidable creative partnership that even what i can't see i trust her eyes to know and she helps me figure out in the process and in the rewriting and I'm very, very grateful for her. Um, she did an extraordinary job on, on Shadowland and I look forward to what she will do with it in the future and what she'll do with Colored Water. Um, Candace and I spent about a month together in New Orleans. Um, I'm there every few months for, for you know a month or so at a time. And it was important to have her there. And she's been a couple of times with me actually um, to spend time, to stand in the place that Shadowland was, for me to introduce her to uh, the Dispenses, namely my um, third great cousin once removed, who I call my Uncle Tony because of the age difference, um, the grandson of the founder of Shadowland, who actually passed April 7th of last year. But she got to meet him. He was our family historian and taught me 
um, much of what I know about our family history and, and the history of New Orleans and our presence in that city. Um, but she got to meet him. And so there is a way that she knows my work and my family that is quite different than that of uh, an average director who may have not um, been to the city or spent extensive time there or stood in the place or know the people. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. And likewise, I'm grateful for the incomparable, you know, Lizanne Mitchell, who, and I joke with her about how I'm obsessed with The Preacher's Wife. It is my Christmas movie. And the first <laughs> time I remember seeing Miss Lizanne on film was that movie. And when I met her, I, she didn't understand that I wasn't fangirling about theater. I mean, she's fantastic on stage, but I remember being a little girl watching The Preacher's Wife and being like, oh my gosh, she was on judge. <laughs> and it's the thing I bring up every Christmas because I'm like, you know, I'm getting ready to watch my movie, Miss Lizanne. Like, <laughs> that time again. Um, and so that's like my earliest childhood memory, funny enough, of Miss Lizanne. And now I have the audacious task of getting to write roles for her. Um, it is not often that you find an actor, an actress who uh, is as intentional about connection to spirit, um, who as, is as open to intergenerational connection um, and just like creating work with you from, from a place of respect and love. Um, and so when you find that you hold on and so there are at least three plays at this point, because you know about the Elders play that I was talking to you about. May, um, it doesn't have a title yet, but um, that I've been able to, to hear her voice and say, oh, I know what she would do with that. Or I don't know exactly what the choice in this moment of this line would be, but I trust her to tell me what it should be. And she's gonna do something fabulous that's gonna be right in the pocket of this character. And so there, there are three different roles that I, have written for uh, Miss Lizanne specifically because I trust her like that. Um, and so she's also kind of made it hard for some other elder uh, women actresses because they're kind of like, well, I know Lizanne probably got that role. So they don't even like really ask me about things. But um, I, am, I am so grateful to have her in my life, let alone my work. So to have both is, I, you know, a gift beyond what I deserve sometimes. So um, it's, it's a joy, it's a joy. And I'm, I'm so honored to be able to write the women I write for her and with her. Um, she, helps, she helps me figure them out. <laughs> Lizanne, respond to that. All I can say is, <laughs> wow. Something, you know, all I can say is good things come to those who wait. Hmm. You know? <laughs> because I mean, I, 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 I never thought I would be you know, so satisfied and so honored and so challenged, you know, in this way. And uh, I, yeah, and I remember talking to Erica, you know, on the steps of the Lark Theater, you know, we had just come down from some kind of presentation. She said, you know, we're going to work together. And, <laughs> and, you know, she is so, I mean, she is a petite angel but she's an archangel because she really means what she says. You know, it's, this is not, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, it's not like, you know, so many people tell you, oh, we, oh, we got to do this. We got, you know, and, and you just say, okay, okay, okay. But she really, she really, really means it. And um, heretofore, uh, I don't know, I, 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 in, a, in a way, I, I think I was waiting for her. Okay. Mm. That makes I really no. do. I was I was I was I was talking, you know, at our um our toast for Shadowland. And um yeah, you can probably identify with this uh Marcia. Um I, I, I started out young, but you know, I, I I feel like I was a good actress when I was really, really young because I was so full. And I I watched so many years go by knowing that I'm not gonna be able to tell the tale of that woman or that woman, or that woman, or that woman, because mm -hmm. they weren't written. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean you, you, we're coming from a people who, for the first 300 years here, what you had to go through just to be able to learn to read and write with your whole, the violence that could be done to your body and your spirit, just from wanting to learn. You know, so like, I, 
you, you, you have to wait. But this is a time that we're going through right now that is irrefutable and the whole universe is changing. The whole uni And I'm so glad that I can be alive and able to communicate what's going on from the minds of these amazing young writers who Erica is in the forefront of right now. This Absolutely. is the vanguard and we, we, we've never had it like this before. No, this is extraordinary. This is, an, this is an extraordinary time that we're living in and uh, a ch challenging time, but an extraordinary time. And speaking of challenges, Lizanne, you sing in this <laughs> and it's absolutely wonderful. Yes. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the role of music in this play, because it definitely has a role in Shadowland. But I was just blown away by the fact that when I was listening to it, I was just like, that's Lizanne singing. Wow, you can sing. So let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, uh, number one, I feel like uh, music is part of the scenery, part of the the blood, you know, of the black experience. You just can't, one doesn't exist without the other. You know, it's just in us all the time, 24 seven. That's how we operate. I've always thought, I said, you know, that's why Michael Jordan can hang in the air because that man is in possession of what the, the keys of rhythm are about and he can just hold it. <laughs> Look around and make a decision about what he's going to do. Yes. <laughs> so it is, you know, like I, 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 I think that our rhythm is so much in sync with the rhythm of the universe. I mean, not just the, the, the Milky Way, but the whole universe. That's how we vibe and that's who, who we are. That's why I'm saying, you know, humanity has been missing out on all of this. But oh, here we are. Here we are. And here's Erica, et cetera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh, Erica, why don't you talk a little bit about yeah. um, Delphio? Oh man, Marcellus. legend, 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 legendary family. Um, the, the patriarch of the Marcellus family actually um, passed away last year from uh, COVID mm -hmm. and we had not been able to give the, the proper send off as we would in New Orleans because of um, you know, funeral restrictions, burial restrictions, and just, you know, COVID in general. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that, but um, I knew that the trombone was the central instrument in this play. And so naturally I'm going down the line of the great trombonists from New Orleans. And so, um, because he is who he is and the family that he's from. I mean, Branford, his brother, um, works with uh, Ruben a lot and actually did the music for Ma Rainey. And so, um, you Ruben, know, I'm like, oh, as in no. Ruben Santiago Hudson. Yes, 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 okay. yes. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, and I was thinking about who would understand the various uh, New Orleans sounds that I was bringing together in one place, um, who had the skill and the uh, flexibility to uh, transform the, the sound and world of the play through sound. And it could only be him, it could only be him. Um, and so he brings together for this process a host of other legends. And so he's like, oh, I'll grab this person on the drums and I'm gonna ask this professor legend of jazz at you know Tulane about this thing that we was wondering. Um, and I'm referencing, you know, uh, members of the Cotton Club band, uh, Cotton Club band that was the house band of Shadowland. Um, and we're talking, uh, you know, folks who stepped in or, or the musicians and he's like, oh, that's that Bolden sound, okay, right here is this. And he, his, his ear is so precise. Uh, he's, he's so funny and just so incredibly talented and also shifts the atmosphere with his presence. And so there is a way that bringing in folks who don't uh, generally work within theater, 
um, who open up our process and shift our ways of doing things in ways that uh, we learn a lot from. So Dell would come into like production meetings and um, you know it's time for him to give his report and he'll play like 30 seconds to a minute of music first. And you know, the, the regular theater production people are like, this is not how we do things, what is happening, right? But he's like, y'all need to loosen up. Well, we need to shift the atmosphere. Is everybody feeling better now? And it's a very New Orleans thing that we are going to come into this space, right? Um, a bit more jovial. We're gonna come in more ourselves, not as tense. And um, there is a way that he was able to, um, aid the places in the text that um, we're able to like levitate that are lighter um, and also give the, the weightiness, the gravity of um, dire moments, what they needed sonically too through uh, soundscape, largely through horn, um, imitating different uh, aspects of the storm and flood. And I'm really, really grateful that um, we had him on this project that Lizanne essentially got to have a, a song recomposed for her uh, by this jazz legend. And, and that was, that's just such a beautiful memory that um, I am forever grateful for. And I look forward to working with him on other projects because he's Uncle Dale, so he will be Aww. back. <laughs> okay, um, Max, right now um, I'd like to play the uh, trailer from uh, from Shadowland, if you will, um, because we're running kind of short on time and I want people to hear just a, just a bit of this as much as we can. So could you please play the trailer from Shadowland? It's 29th, 2005 in New Orleans. Mama, be careful. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? You was taking too long. I came to get my purse. I got your purse, Mama. Your pills in there. I was just grabbing a few things before we go. And Hurricane Katrina lunges towards the city. Wind's picking up. Got to get to the Superdome before the storm hits the city. Oh, people get so scared when the National Guard shows up. Make it seem like more than a little wind and rain. As tensions between duty and desire surface. Mama, it's getting worse. We have to sell Shadowland. I can't sell it. It ain't mine to give away. Yours neither. Air property. You fixing to sell our whole legacy to some developer slicker than snot on a doorknob. What I got for me, huh? You got Shadowland. Ernie got his construction business, and I'm just swinging from pillar to post. What I got for me that ain't full up with everybody else? A levy is brought to its knees. I need somebody to come to 1921 Washington Avenue. The water is up to my waist, ma'am, and it keeps rising. What you mean rescue operations ain't starting yet? Ma'am, it's an emergency. Ain't that when emergency crews supposed to come during an emergency? Sudden confinement strips us down and calls us in. Have you come for me? Have you come for me? Have I come for you? Have I come for you? Come. See how the city will invite you to dance and snatch the floor from right underneath you. The Public Theater presents Shadowland, a new audio play by Erica Dickerson Dispenza, directed by Candace C. Jones. Now available for free on-demand streaming at publictheater.org on the Public's Play Now platform and wherever podcasts are available. You heard me. You heard her. That's sun <laughs> she's a whole phenomenon in and of herself. Masika Sunny. Oh yeah. my goodness. That was absolutely amazing. And I was able to listen to Shadowland earlier today. And it is an extraordinary piece of work. And I would encourage you all to go to publictheater.org and give it a listen. It is free mm -hmm. of charge. And one 
final thought from each of you before we say goodbye, but also to say thank you to Jana and Justin at the Public Theater for making this interview possible. So final thought? New Orleans has so much to teach us. New Orleans has so very much to teach us if we would be open and willing to learning. Um, thank you to the people of the New Orleans, the city of New Orleans, my heart, um, the artists of New Orleans who came together for this project. And may we learn um, from this nexus of black culture so that we never again experience the moment we're in now and the moment we were in in 2005. Lizanne. I would say that there is a tremendous outpouring of love coming from the theater, coming from the arts, coming from the people now. And I would invite you to open your mind, open your spirit and open your heart to enjoy, to be healed, to be uplifted and to spread this love that's coming at us. Thank you so very much for joining us for Backstage Stories. Please come back next week. We have an, another exciting program for you and we'll end it with some more of Delphio, like Romeo Marsalis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his music from Shadowland and you'll be able to get information about the audio play in the archives of Backstage Stories, as well as Erica's list of songs that she would like to share with you about New Orleans. So have a great evening and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Saturday evening at 7 p.m., two plays by Gloria J. Brown Marshall. First, Dreams of Emma Till. Thank you. Okay. We can talk now. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank that you was so fun. Thank you so very much. Uh, let me stop recording.